I'll say it to your face, you know it. All right, well, hey, let's get going here. It's two minutes after. Um, my name is Randy Estes, and I'm the Western Regional Manager and uh, President of Valve Accessories. We want to welcome you here to our webinar via Zoom. We want to encourage you guys to interact with us. Either unmute your mic or use the chat function. Uh, the more interaction that we have, the better this webinar is going to be for everybody. Um, and also, please note that after this webinar, we will post it on our YouTube channel. So take advantage of that. Uh, if there's people in your office that maybe didn't have the time to see it, please make sure that uh, you go to our YouTube channel and take a look at it. Also to, to point out, today we're gonna be talking about linear mounting, okay? And specifically, there's some sheets under our quick help, or te technical quick help section on our website, and it's basically linearity, linear rules of thumb, because linear mounting is a little bit more to it than the simple rotary mounting is. So um, we're gonna be talking a lot about those rules of thumb. We're gonna be talking, and Scott, here in a second, is gonna be talking about how we actually mount to an, a linear actuator. He's also gonna be talking a lot about the different theories uh, that are involved to mount to those linear actuators. So Scott, it's all yours, buddy. All right. Um, Randy kind of, Randy did mention that we've got a couple of documents. We're gonna screen share for a second and go over those documents real quick, kind of let you see them. Um, and then we'll kind of get into it. Basically these documents are just gonna help you to kind of determine what, what you need to do when you go to the linear mounting. Uh, this first page, the most important part of this first page is toward, towards the middle of the paper there. You see that there's two, there's a number one and number two. That's the first thing you want to think about when you're mounting something linear. You want to know what the stroke length is. When we're looking at a analog positioner specifically, you're going to have to know which cam to select. And that's going to be based on your the length of stroke. And we'll talk some here in a minute about a CC dimension and what that is, how to determine that. Those papers will also go through and show you what CC dimension you need to have for a given rotation to fit the cam you're gonna be using. Uh, another thing though, though first, the, the easiest, kind of the main rule of thumb we use when we're looking at stroke lengths and looking at which cam we're gonna use is as you see that number one and number two there towards the middle of the page. Anything from two inch and down, and we're gonna use a 30 or 60 degree cam, which is our C3 cam. And, and the 30 or 60, whether we use a 30 degree side or a 60 degree side, it's really gonna be determined what CC dimension we can get out of the positioner um, and, and the mount. The other is anything two inch and up, we're gonna use the 90 degree cam. Um, and what we're gonna go over today, uh, yep. so, this page, the next page is more into the stroke theory. So you've already determined you got plus or minus two inches. So now you can look at this and kind of gives you some diagrams and stuff, shows you how to determine how to use that CC dimension and kind of how to determine what your CC dimension needs to be. Uh, so that's this that page and the next page is really all that is. Got kind of goes into a little more detail. Um, it's something that you'll be able to go to the website and download, copy. Um, you know, so that you can have to use in the future if you've got any questions, but we're available as well anytime you have any questions. So here's a little more, that's the second page of the first, uh, the, more really the second page of the second document. Uh, it is helpful. All right, so we've, we've talked several times about CC dimension. Um, what CC is, we'll go over in a second a little more in detail, but CC is really the center line of the positioner to the center line of your pickup point. Uh, this page here, that last page was just a quick little page showed you how to uh, come up so a little, just a little more detail on dimensions and CC dimensions and stuff in rotations. So what we're going to do now is we're going to kind of bring, come back to the screen. And, uh, then there's a few things we'll show you. We're going to talk about some, some different mounting kits that we have. If you look, if you saw in our picture before, when we talk about a CC dimension, one of the C's is going to be the center line of our pickup point. For this, for today, we're going to be using a Fisher actuator and valve. So our pickup point, we have an easy pickup point right in the middle of the actuator. That's one of our C's. That's the center line of our pickup. When the other dimension that we will look at 
it's going to be the center line of the positioner. So it's the center line of the spindle. And the CC dimension is actually just the offset of those two center lines. So where you mount that positioner off the center line, and that's the CC dimension. That's the measurement we're looking for. Today, um, we're going to be mounting on a Fisher valve and kind of going to go over that with you guys. If you look to the, the right side of the valve here, this is a back linear mounting kit. That's a standard mounting kit. We use it a whole lot. It's really flexible. It fits. Um, Bob, Randy, you guys probably can help me on this, that how many different positioners, it'll, I mean, actuators, you, we can use it on to mount our positioner, like a Coax Vulcan. Yeah, so pretty much you know, all the Fisher stuff that, that uses that style actuator, the larger actuators, Cope, CCI, Hamel Doll, older Mason Neal and stuff, uh, the bigger Warren controls valves, the, the uh, larger Honeywell valves, the list goes on. Everybody used the same thing. Yeah, and, and the main thing is the, that when you see this type of pad with the two and, an in, two and a quarter inch bolts or uh, bolts flats, um, that they're two and a quarter inches apart. It actually, you can, it doesn't have to be that two and a quarter dimension, but that's a standard that most people use um, because the T-bracket we have will actually mount here and that allows us, but that's the, that's the back linear kit. Um, you'll notice there's a whole lot of pieces in the kit that you actually won't use. We try to make it really flexible depending on the size of the valve um, and actuator package and where the positioner actually mounts. Um, there's a couple of different lengths bolt, length of bolts. There's a couple of the Nolitron sleeves that you can trim down the length to make sure to get the spacing right. But that's something we'll go over a little more detail whenever we actually do the mounting. But if you look behind the behind the fissure here, you'll see that we have other options available. Two of those valves, one's a Warren valve, one is a Samson valve. Those have what we kind of call our linear, they're more of a, a Nemours globe valve. Um, it uses a bracket that's just an L bracket. So it mounts, usually there will be a rib on the side of the actuator and it'll mount. And you have an up and down adjustment, but we use these two holes to mount the positioner so we don't have a CC adjustment. So generally, we use a type of takeoff, we try to use a takeoff that has a, our second pickup point, instead of being fixed in the center, now we have that CC adjustment with it. Uh, the, the, the back linear kit uses a turnbuckle style. The reason for the turnbuckle is, with this particular mounting, it's basically just to offset the positioner. Um, if you notice on the, the two valves in the background, they both have the positioners mounted in the middle of the stroke, right where the pickup point is. Those are using what we call a pin and fork style takeoff. And we have a couple of different options on pin and fork. We have a short linear arm and a longer linear arm. And the, the pin and fork is the pin goes through the arm, and as the stem rises and falls, as the stem rises and falls, the pin slides in and out on the arm. So that's a basic pin and fork. If you look at the knife gate valve, it has a very similar style. It's pin and fork. It uses what we call uh, our knife gate linear arm. Um, it's just a pin with a D2 spindle, a different, slightly different style spindle, but it works on the same principle that you actually have a bolt that affixes to the blade or the yoke and as it rotates, as it slides up and down, it rotates our positioner. All of our positioners by design and by nature are rotary. Even though today we're talking about linear mounting, our positioners are still rotary positioners. They are, we're using our mounting kit, this pin and fork design or the turnbuckle design to convert that linear motion to a rotary motion so our positioner can act, act so can, can use that motion. Uh, so that being said, we don't have a positioner that's specifically a linear positioner or specifically a rotary positioner. They're all rotary positioners. You just have to order them with the right cam, right spindle and everything to fit your application. And that really is the case even on rotary stuff. Even rotary actuators, you have to have a specific spindle and specific cam for that particular actuator. So this is no different. It's just a different, you know, motion. So um, another, so we're, we're back to looking back at what we're going to be using on our 
Fisher kit is it will be, like I said, a turnbuckle style. And the turnbuckle, like I said, what it's allowing us really to do is move our center line back to where our position will be mounted. Um, we have a short turnbuckle and a longer turnbuckle available when you have a much larger package and there's it's a much larger actuator that you need to compensate for the offset. Um, I'm going to have to apologize because today with mounting this up, I'm going to have to walk in front of the camera some, so the camera will probably be red because of my shirt. Just this, your whole screen will be red, but we'll get through it and hopefully everything works out. <laughs> Scott, I just want to jump in again, and guys, if anybody has any questions, please uh, use the chat function. If you don't want to talk or you don't have the mic, or unmute your mic and just ask questions. This, this come, sometimes we, we breeze over a lot of this stuff, and maybe there's a specific question we'd love to address. Them. Yeah, there's a lot of stuff that we do. We do this pretty regular, so it's stuff that we kind of just assume people know, but it's oftentimes that people don't know. Um, so I'm going to get into it here in a second where we actually get to the mounting. Uh, one thing I want to just talk about is on the Fisher valve and oftentimes when we go to look for mounting, if you call us and you want a mounting kit and you don't see it in our mounting kit list, uh, linear kits are usually the ones that are the hardest to do, mainly because you need to know a few things. You need to know what the stroke length is so we can determine what can we need. The other thing is we need to have, this is generally the hardest part to figure, is how we're going to take off from the stem. Like I said, the Fisher valves, some Warren valves, a bunch of other valves are pretty good because they have drilled and tapped yokes in the middle, or their, their couplers are drilled and tapped, so we have a ready pickup point that won't be any problem to work with. Um, but oftentimes, we just have a bare stem with a threaded nut or something that doesn't have this nice threaded hole. So we do have the option of a stem clamp, and what it is is two pieces, and it has kind of a triangulated design, so you can use it on several different stem sizes. Uh, but that will allow us to now have our 5 16 pickup point, which is what's used in the back linear kit. Hey, Scott, I'm going to interrupt just for a second. So will you point out that two and a quarter uh, bolt pattern on that actuator where the, the T-bracket bolts? Yeah, that pattern right there is that little pad and the opposite side of the valve has a similar pad slightly higher. Yeah, it's about that this. is the, the pad that uh, tells us that you need to use what we call the back linear kit. Yep. Uh, the, the, the kit that Scott's using today. If the valve doesn't have that pad, then there's no more with a rib on the side of the yoke and some other stuff that can be done. But this is Which one of the more common. Uh, like I said, if it had the rib on the side. I do a bracket like this that will mount off to the side. Uh, Warren, uh, OMC. Hey Scott? Yes. Scott, this can't. Uh, we're assuming that the valve, uh, the valve and actuator have been bench set already? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, right. and, and as we know, the bench setting really just determines that if it loses air, because, um, you know, the, the bench set is generally what well, we're going to use the generic of the 3 to 15. All that really, you know, is to telling you this, that when it loses air, that the spring's going to be strong enough to close it. Because once we come in and we put a position on, now we're able to use whatever the maximum pressure the diaphragm can handle. So it gives it a little more power than just a regular 3 to 15, like the old style stuff that was, you know, pneumatic control or controlled, but then actually putting a 3 to 15 signal on the diaphragm. Now we can put 60 pounds of air on the diaphragm, and it's a lot stronger. And... Um, that's that's really important, Scott, because I'm gonna I'm just gonna repeat what you just said. Because yeah. we get that question a lot where the bench set is three to fifteen, but the max air pressure on it is like you said, sixty. The positioner is not gonna output three to fifteen, it's gonna output close to the supply pressure coming in, which will make the valve package move faster. So don't don't get hung up on the three to fifteen going to diaphragm. Yeah. Ideally you want the, the supply pressure to be set at or just below the uh, allowable supply pressure for the actuator to get the best performance out of the package. Hey, Scott? Yes. Yeah, Nick Gabriel. Hey, Nick. Hey, uh, also on the Fisher, uh, it's not the same for the Fisher Gouldy. Make sure that they know that. You got two different versions, you know, the same kit for the, the linear that you're using now will not fit the, will not fit the Gouldy. 
Um, right. It'll it'll take the other style. So if someone just goes in and says, "Hey, I want a fisher kit," you know, get a two inch stroke, and, you, and they're going to send them the T the T style. Well, it isn't going to work. Yes. Yeah. The, so the, like we're using just the back linear, the standard back linear on this particular right. one, smaller package. We do have some options and variations of this, like uh, Dick was saying, that we have some that's pretty large. That instead of a T bracket. It'll have an L-shaped bracket, which in, so in, it'll have adjustment up and much further down, which kind of helps also with. And there's other couple of designs that we go to the L-bracket when these holes are very close to the diaphragm that would cause an interference. Yeah, and and the valve specifically that Dick is talking about, the Gouldy, is it mm -hmm. uses uh, two round bars for the yoke yeah. instead of the cast yeah. yoke, and so that's a different linkage kit entirely, simply because that flat pad that I had Scott point out earlier doesn't exist on that actuator. So that's why when somebody has a linear application, sometimes we have a lot more questions than we would normally have for a rotary. Just to make sure that you're getting the parts you need. Yeah. Um, what we'll do is we're going to kind of start mounting this guy. Um, we're going to, today to get, get to to where you can actually see what's going on. So bear with us a little bit. We'll have to spin the table so you can get a view of what's happening behind the positioner because I could mount it up. You wouldn't see half of it. And I don't know that it really help you any. So we're going to go at this. And like I said, bear with me. I'm going to walk in front of the camera a few times just because um, I'm not transparent. And <laughs> <laughs> Far from it. <laughs> so first, uh, on this particular actuator in valve package, we have a three quarter inch valve. Uh, it's three quarter inch stroke. I'm sorry, I'll say that three quarter inch stroke. So if we look at our pages that we talked about earlier and we look at our options. So we know at three quarters of an inch stroke, we are, we are under two inches. We're under two inches. So we're gonna be looking at a C3 cam. While we're looking at our, we can look at our We'll look at our measurement. We can look at our sheets and using a C3 cam, we'll know that to find our CC dimension, we'll have to take our stroke and looking at the formulas on one of our, the several pages we have. I think all three of the documents have the formulas, but we'll take our three quarter dimension, so 0.75, and we'll multiply it by 1.87, and that will give us what CC dimension we're going to look for. So again, that CC dimension is our center line to center line dimension. And all it really is, is linear, all the linear mounting determining the cam, it's all geometry. It's all about geometry in these formulas. And it's, it seems intimidating at first, but it's really not. And there's, we've, on these documents, we've shown a couple of different ways you can do it, a couple of different formulas. We have a bunch of different cams available. There's actually more than even show on these documents, but we try to simplify it to where we really only use really two two camps and that's the C1 and C3. Like I said, we have others available in kind of more troublesome applications, but we have 45 degree cams and some other stuff whenever we can't get the CC dimension that we're looking for. Kind of sometimes you're just stuck with what you got and you kind of have to make things work. So we have other options available. Hey Scott. Yes. Uh, Gita asked a question in the chat about um, you know how stroke length was determined and I answered her that you know the valve is going to determine the stroke. The manufacturer is going to state the stroke. But could you also just point out where the, the stroke indicator is on that valve so that yeah. you know, if somebody needed to go out and actually measure the stroke length because the tags were gone and they couldn't find, you know, right. uh, documentation on it where they would yeah. measure the stroke? So on this particular valve, if you look here towards the middle of the yoke, we have a little indicator here. This particular valve is spring closed, so it's a fail closed and it is spring down. So we're putting air on the bottom side of the diaphragm to push it up. So what's gonna happen as we put air on this, this indicator is this little disc is showing closed currently. As we air it up, it will raise up and go to the closed position. Um, oftentimes, as I'm sure we've all been into plants where you can't see this, this has long been gone, no idea but you're doing a retrofit or even in your shop if you don't have one. Um, it's as simple as kind of determining what the maximum pressure is, taking the air off the valve, making a mark, you can make a mark on this yoke, put full pressure on the valve, let it stroke all the way open, make a mark and then you just measure between the two marks and it'll give you your overall stroke. Um, 
You can't really assume, don't ever assume that because you have a four inch valve, you have a four inch stroke. Most control valves have a much smaller stroke than the actual line size. Um, we talked a little bit earlier about knife gates. Generally knife gates are the opposite. Um, that you can pretty much determine that if you've got a six inch knife gate, you're gonna have at least six inches of stroke. But on control valves, you do, and that's one of the first things we'll ask is if you call and ask us to help you mount a, a linear valve, we're gonna know what the stroke length is. And like I said, simple, the simple way is if it's got a tag, oftentimes it'll tell you what the stroke is. If there's no tag, hopefully there's an indicator that you can actually measure between the top and bottom marks. And this, like this, in this case, we'll give you three quarters of an inch. Um, if not, you may have to actually just make a reference point, mark it, air the actuator up, let it stroke all the way to the other direction, whether that's open or closed, make a mark there and measure between the two marks. And, and knowing how to determine this stroke length can be the difference between being able to offer the customer, uh, you know, a solution to their problem and not being able to. So, you know, sometimes people look at this and go, well, I don't know the stroke length, so I got to buy a new valve. They don't need to necessarily need a new valve. We can retrofit a positioner onto their existing valve. Just need to use a ruler. Right. Thanks so much. You're very welcome. So as, as we said, we've, I've kind of done some of the math beforehand on this particular one. Three quarters of an inch stroke times 1.87 gives us a CC dimension of 1.4 inches. So just under between one and three eighths and one and a half inches, somewhere in that area. Um, so what we're gonna do first and foremost is we're gonna mount up our T-bracket first. And the way I'm gonna mount this up is I'm gonna mount with the T to this side. You can mount it to either side. Um, what you'll just have to watch is that all determine on how you set the cam up. Um, so we'll look at that in a minute as well. So I'm gonna try to do this the best I can. Stay out of the way where y'all can see what's happening. In this linkage kit that Scott's using here, uh, this is one, one of the ones where we have uh, photo mounting instructions. So the, the instruction sheet that comes in the package with the linkage kit actually has step-by-step -step photographic mounting instructions. It makes your life way easier. And Bob, there's also a slick video on YouTube with me about 15 There is. <laughs> All right, guys, so what I did is I went ahead and I'll go over something in a minute. Um, I snug these bolts down because I kind of cheated and marked, but I'll show you how to make that adjustment in a minute. Um, but what we're going to look at first, well, I'll, I will, uh, let's go ahead and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use one of my loose Z brackets kind of just as a reference point because this will be mounted to the back of the positioner. And what it's going to, allow us to do is look at the center line of our positioner and get an idea of where we should be. Uh, there's a couple different ways to measure the CC. We have a couple options. We've kind of, Bob was kind enough to 3D print us some little plastic scales that are really helpful. Um, they work really well, but it's just, a, you can use a simple, you know, slide ruler, pocket ruler, or we have these available that we can use for the measurement. Like I said, I went ahead and snug this up, but I'll loosen them back just to kind of give you an indication or show you how exactly it works. But I went ahead and mounted the Z bracket up to give myself an idea of this is going to be the center line of the positioner. In the middle of this bracket, so these are the four mounting holes that will bolt to the back of the positioner. Your spindle will go through the middle of the hole. So if you draw a line through the middle of this, and we draw a line straight up and down parallel to the valve stem, what we're looking to do is that we figured the CC dimension is 1.4 inches. So what we can do is we can kind of eyeball this. We're going to set the center of the stem at zero, and we're going to measure over until we have 1.4 inches to the center of this, of the mount of the Z bracket. Once we have that lined up, then we can go ahead, lock this bracket down because we know now that we have our CC dimension correct. So our mounting orientation and configuration is gonna be right for our 30 degree cam. Because we've determined that we need a 30 degree cam already, we've got a positioner with it. We, the positioner I pulled the show today is gonna to have a 30 degree cam in it. We go from there. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna have to remove, go ahead and remove this. So to get that 1.4 inches, Scott, you 
used the formula in the sheet right and multiplied the stroke length by 1.87 1.87 for 30 degrees yeah if this was a 90 degree act if this was a, a four inch stroke let's say the, the formula for four inch stroke you measure by 0.5 or anything for 90 because you're going to use 90 degrees so for 90 degrees of rotation you multiply by 0.5 so four inch stroke the cc dimension would be four inches times 0 0.5 or two inches two inches yeah. Kaylin, uh, carly uh can you share that that slide just really fast because i think that that that'll make it really simple for everybody to understand uh it was the third one where so if you look at the kind of the right hand side above the go. title block on the lower right hand corner, you'll see that certain rotations have certain multipliers for a given or take your stroke times a certain uh, multiplier and it will give you the CC dimension, which what that is, is you'll have to move that T bracket in and out to get your center line to center line to match the number that you came up with. So even though in this case we have a nice even 0.75, if you come up and you have an inch and a half or two inch stroke or one inch stroke, you know, you just use that 0.187 and we'll tell you what your CC dimension is. So you'll make sure you mount that CC. So your center line of your pickup point to the center line of your positioner needs to be what the, what the formula gave you as an answer. Hopefully everybody understands that. that. That sheet right there, that is the Bible for figuring out which cam you need for the valve that your customer has. Right. And if you look kind of the left side of the, the, towards the bottom of the page, you'll see that we have several different arms. Those are pin and fork long arms and different options. And it showed you kind of the max, we're, we're assuming all those are longer strokes, but we show what the approximate maximum stroke length, stroke range you can get out of those using a 90 degree cam because pretty much the six inch stuff towards the bottom and the linear arms we could go down to one inch but using 90 degrees but at that point you're just going to go to a 30 degree cam but you're still going to be able to manage the one inch of stroke easily yeah and, and the reason we go, we go down to the 30 degree cam when we when possible is it provides the best linearity um, the, the smaller the rotation of the cam, the better the linearity of the calibration of the position is going to be. All right. All right. So we got our, we've determined our CC dimension. I've removed the Z bracket, um, snug the T bracket down. So now it's fixed. We know we're going to have the right CC dimension. Um, one thing I went ahead and did was kind of cheated and went ahead and mounted, we're going to mount our positioner off to the side. What I did was went ahead and mounted our bracket to the back of our positioner, uh, the Z bracket, and I popped our spindle in. This mount, this will mount. This will mount off to the side. Um, first, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my linear arm. Uh, this particular one, we don't use the spring because we're going to use a turnbuckle. So I am going to mount it to the bottom of my positioner. I'm gonna slide it over the stem. And I am going to... The, the spring that Scott just referenced is a like a leaf spring. It's a long wire spring. And it's used when there's a pin that slides in the slot in that arm. If you're not gonna have the pin slide in the arm, you don't need the spring. It just gets in your way. But it, it is shipped with every arm. I hope I'm not hiding the view too much. Uh, you're doing good, man. Something here? Until right now, you were doing great. <laughs> <laughs> what I'm doing now, you know, it's, it's a trick. It's mad. All right. So we've got the um, position mounted up. Um, now we also have the option of depending on. So, like I said, what the turnbuckle does is allows us to shift the positioner up and down where the mounting point is. Um, if we were using a pin and fork style, this positioner would have to be mounted. The center line of this would match the center line of the pickup point. Being how we're using this, being how this is mounted this way, um, we don't have to worry about that because we'll adjust that. We can adjust this height and we have the ability to adjust the turnbuckle. So if you can bear with me just a second, I'm going to snug this up and we're going to 
spin the table to where you can get a little better view of what has happened. Just to kind of dovetail on what we talked about last time, the retrofit and, and, the, re and the mounting kit guide, it, these are all, all mounting kits are listed by the manufacturer and the make and the model number and the size. So for example, this would be a 657 size 40, correct? Yeah, that's correct. And that's uh, our part number 3509 requires a D4 spindle. And that last part that Randy mentioned needs, requires a D4 spindle. That, it's called that in the mounting kit sheet. But if you don't have the D4 spindle, that arm isn't going to fit. And what that refers to is the back of the arm we're using has the round opening for a D4 spindle. Um, like I mentioned earlier, we have other options of other spindles that would take a D2 square spindle. But this particular one, like Randy said, this the positioner model for this that we're using today is a B200E D430 AC3. So we're using electro-pneumatic positioner. Um, the D4 gives us the D4 spindle for the correct linear arm. The 30 degrees tells us we got a 30 degree indicator. And uh, the A means we have an arrow and the C3 indicates that we have a C3 cam, which is 30 or 60 degree cam, depending on which side of the cam you use. A uh, Couple of things we're fixing to do. So I've got the positioner mounted. Everything's kind of set up, snugged up. Now, uh, what, what you would do is make sure that height that we had adjusted before, so the height of the positioner up and down on the T-bracket, is so that when we bolt our turnbuckle up, that it will be long enough to fit. Uh, this thing is adjustable, and I'll show you in a second how, how you can adjust it. Um, actually, what it is as you can, there's a jam nut, you loosen the jam nut as you spin this, one is right hand, one is left hand thread. So as you spin it one direction, you'll increase the distance between these two eyes, and as you spin it the other direction, you can decrease it. So if you get it a little bit higher or longer, you can change the length of this arm. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to put this turnbuckle on. I'm not going to tighten it down yet. Just get it on. So it, it, we like to use a turnbuckle when we can. It's a very, very robust method of mounting the, uh, the, the linkage. It's strong. Um, the, the turnbuckle resembles the tie rod in the steering of your car. It's a very well proven technology. And, and if we can use a turnbuckle, it also provides a little more linear response out of the positioner than a pin and fork. What I'm doing is just trying to snug us up a little bit here. So we can get close to where we want to be. A little too snug. And one thing you want to make sure, and it's a call we get pretty regular, is when you put that linear arm on, we kind of want everything a little bit loose to begin with. And then as we kind of get towards to where we want to be having everything mounted. We want to start snugging things up, tightening things down. Quite often we'll get a call that a uh, positioner is, they mounted it and it's going full stroke with any signal. Oftentimes what happened is back in here, I'm not sure if you guys can see that on this turnbuckle, on, I mean on the, on the linear arm, there is a pinch bolt. So that round bar, that round spindle goes inside that turn or inside that linear arm and you have to tighten that bolt so it pinches tight. If not, it'll spin free and it's going to act just like the unit has a loose cam. In, in um, the, I'm sorry, Scott, let me jump in for a second. Oh. The, other, the other thing that we need to do but while, while we're adjusting the, the, the arm there is to make sure that the cam nuts loose on the cam. Yes. If not, it's going to fight you and it's, it'll be, a, it's much, much easier to have that cam nut loose. which I have my cam nut loose. So now the arm's tight and you'll notice that I can still move this linear arm because my cam nut inside is tight. Um, the next step will be attaching your turnbuckle to your arm or to your pickup point. Um, one thing we did, we kind of talked about is the kit 
we have a couple of different, different colors of the same material, similar materials. But what I'm going to use is one single piece. It's been trimmed down a little because I'm using the side that fits between the two bolt holes. So it needs a little clearancing. But this is part of the flexibility. And I'm using the shortest uh, bolt that comes in the kit. Hey, Scott, um, if you have to mount this positioner on the opposite side, mm -hmm. is there anything people got to watch out for when they change that turnbuckle out on the fisher valve? Um, if you want to mount it on the back side of the valve on this side? Yes. Um, not really. What you'll have to do is, so if you just took one off and have to turn it to the other side, you're going to change the height of where the positioner is mounted because that turnbuckle is just, a, you know, it only has about an inch of flexibility, maybe an inch of flexibility. So this, if you'll notice, I'm not sure if you can tell, but there's two different planes. So there's a plane here where the one side is mounted and a plane here. And there's, there's maybe an inch and a half difference. So you'll have to, if you mount it on the other side, you'll have to raise that another inch and a half to take care of that difference. But as far as the turnbuckle, no. Now, when you're looking at the positioner, when the stem rises and falls, um, you're gonna have to look at which direction it turns and just make sure the, the cam's configured right for which direction it's gonna turn uh, and how that's gonna react. Uh, one thing, like I said, this, this went together pretty easy. Um, with the turnbuckle, if it was a little long, what you do is you loosen the nut here and you can spin this turnbuckle a little. And as, like I said, as you spin one direction, it's gonna lengthen and you spin the other direction, it's gonna shorten that. Um, what we're trying to look for is if the easiest way to set up a linear valve to make sure everything's right is when you're in the, if you're in your shop, we go ahead and put air on this and drive this actuator to 50% and lock it in place. And we want this arm, our linear arm, we want it to be perpendicular to the valve stem at 50% of stroke. And you can lock everything down at that point. Um, kind of helps you, but out in the field, a lot of times you don't have the, the, the luxury of having a spare regulator and easy access to air other than what's already kind of piped to the actuator. So it's kind of a, so what we're looking now is we right now have this set roughly 15 degrees below perpendicular because we have 30 degrees of travel. We want 15 degrees above and 15 degrees below zero. With everything mounted up in the back here, um, I'm gonna spin the table back so you can see the front. We're gonna kind of go through setting up the cam and go through calibration. And so when Scott's talking about the 30, 15 degrees above and below, you know, perpendicular to the stem, that's ideal. If it's not perfectly, you know, if it's 10 degrees up and 20 degrees down, the valve is going to operate. It's just not going to be quite as linear as it could be if, uh, if it was centered up. So when you're retrofitting one of these in the field and you know you can't get it just perfect, it's going to operate just fine, especially in closed loop control systems where they have like a flow meter uh, telling the valve uh, or telling the control system how much uh, flow is coming through the valve and, and controlling it appropriately. Then it, it's not going to be a big deal. It's ideal to have it equal up and down, but it's not an re absolute requirement. And, and also just, just to define some terms, linear means in, input e equals to output. So if you have 50% of in, input into the positioner, the valve should have 50% of output. Great. Um, so we've got the positioner mounted, nothing's tubed up yet but I went ahead and pulled the cover, pulled the indicator off so I can get to the cam. Um, with this current orientation, with the positioner mounted just to the right of center line, and it's a failed down actuator, as we air it, it raises up. So what we're gonna see as we increase signal and as we add air to the actuator, we're gonna see this move towards the open, <clears throat> the open direction in a clockwise motion. So what we're having to do is make sure we have our cam set up. We've determined we want to be on the 30 degree side. So what we've got is we're on the C3A side, 30 degree linear. And to make sure that when we rotate in that, cam, that clockwise direction that we're on the 30 degree low. Um, if this was mounted on the other side, if we had ch changed the T around, what we would be is we'd be on the C3B side. And you'll notice there's a raised area of the cam here in the middle. Um, 
we would have the roller bearing on the other side and the 30 degree side would be on this side. And that's how we'd operate it. But with our current, the current setup, uh, this is how, this was, so we got it selected properly. Uh, with everything tied in the back, first thing we'll do is we're gonna make sure we have that little bit of preload like we do on any actuator, on any positioner, anytime we mount one. So what that is, is we're gonna rotate the cam a little bit. We're gonna lock it down by hand. Then we're gonna go in here and we're gonna lock our set screw. And what that is, is with a small little kind of tweaker screwdriver, we're able to put the slot, the tip in, the short way, but wide ways, it will not go in there. So we know we have a little bit of adjustment down towards zero if we need it. And this is important on glow valve because as the trim wears, you want space for that to be able to rotate a little further in a closed direction to maintain tight shutoff. Sometimes, Kent, you would kind of ask which side of the positioner you're gonna, or which side of the actuator you're gonna mount the positioner on. This side is, this time mounting it on this side is not ideal because our air ports come out to the left, the air side of the actuators are on the right. So if you're stainless steel hard tubing, it's gonna take a little more tubing, a little more time. But luckily using flex, it's pretty quick and easy. So for what we're using, we're as we increase signal, we're gonna increase output of the positioner. So as we increase signal, we're gonna to drive towards the open position. So what we're gonna do is we have C, C minus plugged on the positioner. Um, all VAC positioners are double acting positioners on the analog products. Um, and if you wanna use it in a single acting application, you just plug the port you're not gonna use. Um, in the first couple pages of the manual, there's several good setup paper pages on how to set your configuration. Uh, like I said, this is gonna be spring return direct acting. So we're setting it up accordingly. So we've plugged one of the ports and we're only using the C plus port. So like I said, as we increase signal going to the IDP, we're increasing output on the C plus. Get some air. All right, so we've got air on the unit. And just like on when we do a rotary positioner, um, we've got the pilot valve with the gold stem sticking out of it. If we want to make sure that this cam is going to rotate in the right direction, what we can do is reach in here and we're going to push this stem, gold stem downward into this aluminum block. And when we do that, we'll see that the valve rotates the direction we want it to rotate. So we know we're in the correct orientation. And we've got pneumatically hooked up properly. If we press down on that, nothing happens. We need to look at how we connect it pneumatically and possibly the cam's not set properly. All we're gonna do is we're gonna set our indicator on. Zero. So we're pretty good there. I'm gonna leave the indicator on so you get a little, a little better idea of how it is operating. I'll put my signal generator on. Hey Scott, are you gonna discuss those gauges? Yes. Because you've not calibrated the unit. No, that's what we're about to do. We're about to calibrate it. Okay. All right. So, yeah, the gauges, um, there's different schools of thought and different um, ideas on when you're using a single acting actuator, um, whether you use three gauges. So this gauge is our I4 gauge. What that really does is tell, basically it's an indicator of the health of the I to P. Um, so when this being an electro pneumatic unit, four milliamps is going to be three PSI output on this I to P. 15 milliamps will be, I mean, sorry, 20 milliamps will be 15 PSI output on this I to P. And that can be read on this gauge. As that's happening, as you're outputting that pressure, it's outputting that pressure into this diaphragm, which is pushing on the spool, which is given, and with our feedback spring, it's given us our, um, where our position needs to be. So like I said, this gauge is very helpful for troubleshooting. Doesn't really do anything for calibration or anything, but it's really more helping helpful troubleshooting. The other three gauges, um, like I said, our C minus port is plugged, which is the top gauge. I like using all four gauges because even though it's not going to anything, it's not reading this port pressure, it's reading what's happening in this pilot valve. So right now, if this were on a double acting unit, it's putting all air out the C minus trying to drive the actuator closed. 
And right now we know that that's what the positioner itself is trying to do, even though there's no air coming out of it, that's what it's trying to do. That there is no pressure going to the driving open port, all the pressures to the driving closed. So the spring is fully in control of this. If this valve isn't able to close with no pressure on the C plus side, it's because it's either the valve sized improperly or there's something wrong inside of it. So that being said, I like having all three gauges on the, even on double acting, I mean, single acting units because it's easier to calibrate and I can actually see what's happening. So and, he's gonna show, and Scott's gonna show you, you calibrate using uh, the C plus and minus gauges. Okay, and you're, you're calibrating based on zero PSI coming out of the gauge. So uh, he's gonna show you why that third gauge makes sense even on a single acting unit in just a moment. All right. So um, I don't know if there's a way to show with the unit I'm using. Right now I have four milliamps on the unit, um, which is gonna be our closed position. If we see this gauge, it's gonna be roughly two and a half, three pounds. Um, it's going to be close enough for this gauge. So we know it's pretty healthy um, that we're set right. Right now we have zero PSI on the C plus. That is going, we're going to adjust our zero first. So four milliamps is our zero position. The C minus gauge we want to see on zero, but we don't know how far it is into the zero. So what we'll do is we will look at our positioner. So as you know, on the V200s, um, in the bottom of the unit, when you pull this rubber plug, the very center screw is the zero, and there's an outer metal ring that is your span. I'm going to adjust the zero current. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn this zero screw. And if you notice, as I turned it, the C minus gauge went to zero, and C plus starts rising. Well, we don't want that to be the case because we want zero pressure here, so I'm going to turn the opposite direction until I see this C plus gauge go to zero in about three to five seconds. Once I know I'm there, so I'm, I have full supply pressure trying to drive the unit closed, even though it's not tubed, that's what the positioner is trying to do. So it's giving it no pressure to open, full pressure to close. So we know we've got our zero adjusted properly. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to go and I'm gonna give this unit 20 milliamps. And if you'll notice, um, what happened was our C plus gauge has come up, C minus has gone down, not all the way to zero. So what we'll do is we'll adjust that just a fuzz until we get our C, C minus to go to zero. So what, that's so what that is telling us Drops a little bit. So what's happening is our C plus has rate risen, driven the valve all the way close. So now, even though, like I said, we're not putting air out, it's not trying to put any air out of the C minus side. So it's not trying to drive it closed. It's all trying to go open. So as you'll notice, now the valve is uh, the valve has rotated some. So we'll drop the pressure back down, or we'll drop our signal back down to zero, and double check it. And we see that our zero, our C plus has dropped down to zero. Good. C minus is up where it should be. So now the unit's calibrated. Scott, will you show them on the inside of the cover where the, you know, there's the the little yellow stickers yeah. that show. So if you ever get to where you're calibrating out in the unit and you've taken this cover off and set it off the side and you can't really remember calibration, if you look inside the cover, um, there actually is a real brief instruction on calibration. So there's a positioner calibration and there's actually a little in, a picture that shows where the zero and span are and how they where they are in orient, uh, their orientation to that spring. Yeah, and, and which direction to turn them. So people will right. say, I don't know which direction to turn it. It's on the inside of the lid. And honestly, I'll be honest, most of the time, I don't remember which one's right. I just turn it and realize it's not going the direction I want it to and turn the other direction. I'm the same way, Scott. That, I mean, it's, and it does that cause any harm to the positioner? It does not. It just- People ask that. Your calibration. Your calibration. If, I turn, if I turn it the wrong direction, am I gonna break anything? No, you're not gonna break anything. No, you're not gonna break anything. Um, 
That being said, mounted and calibrated one. Um, this, so now we've mounted and calibrated a V200E on a linear valve. Don't know exactly how long it took. It took much longer than it would normally take because I'm doing it slowly and explaining a lot of things. So even though people get pretty intimidated by linear mounting, it's not really that hard. This is a pretty small valve. It's two inch. The same principle applies to it if it's a 12 inch valve. Everything, the CC dimensions, the offsets of the, the turnbuckles and all that is just parts change a little bit, but the same theories and concepts on those documents apply to every side of the linear valve. Now, the, the only thing, I'm not sure, you may have mentioned this early on, Scott, but uh, the limitation we have with uh, the V100 and V200 is minimum stroke that we can do is a half an inch. No, so, yeah, I did not, I didn't, I did not mention that. So getting into linear, this being that we did a, a analog product, um, getting down to half inch, below half inch, you actually get into the CC dimensions, you start having some in issues with items that with the geometry, it can't, you can't make it work just because of physics, um, where you can't have two objects occupy the same space. So if you're looking at our little arm, if you measure, if you look at as tight as it can get, there's a dimension there. That would be the closest you can get. So that would be your tightest CC dimension possible. So if you did kind of some backwards math, it comes up a little bit below half inch. So it, technically you can go below half inch, but it's just, it's really hard and it's a, it, it takes an absolute perfect mount, making sure everything's mounted, the CC dimension's right, you have no loss of motion. Um, but so we, we kind of stay everything above half inch and above with analog product. We can go below with digital product because they're just reading a potentiometer. It, it has a minimum range it can read in, but we're not stuck to 30 degrees. Um, I think it's 25 or so, but it's, you can generally cheat that because use your CC dimension and there's some things you can do that you can get you know, beyond that. So does anybody have any questions? Yeah, any questions? If you don't feel comfortable speaking up, open the chat box and, and uh, type it in there and we'll answer it. Type it in there. If you want to hit us up later, go to our website. Or all our emails are on the website. Shoot us an email. Um, um, that being said, uh, I, think, I think we hit everything. I believe you did. I got a question. Um, you can you can do do it justice, but can we walk up to one of these units that's already pre-wired in the field and verify the signal getting to it? What terminals do I connect to on your IDP? Okay, awesome question. So on the IDP, um, I don't know. If, uh, let's see if we can get in there. It's going to be tough to see, but you can. I know it is. It's going to be it's tough to see. Kind of light in there. That'd help. There's a couple of different, it's a little better, I don't know if that's too much light, but wait, what I'm hooked up to is if looking at the VAC out of if you look at the board, there'll be two terminals that say calibration. Um, those are the ones that I'm hooking into now. If you look to the other side, there's two terminals up and down right here. And it's hard to tell, but there's a loop check. So what you would do is if we wanted to know what was being tested to test it, this becomes the bottom closest to the screw is the negative. The one closest to the top is the positive. So you can read off of those and there's di uh, diodes. Oh, yeah, yeah. There's a diode in there that when you connect to that, it doesn't cause a draw on the circuit. So it won't make the positioner move even. So you can measure off of these two, uh, the two prongs to the right. Um, and that will tell you what the signal is coming in without affecting the signal any. Because oftentimes, if you measure across these two, you can make a signal jump a little and it'll cause a draw in the system and move the actual valve. Okay, so I would use my standard Al Altec or whatever calibrator I have to. Yeah, no, you can, or you can use you know, just a regular multimeter. Yeah, you can just use a regular multimeter. Um, you can use the Altec as long as you put it on read and you don't source. You can, you can do it that way. 
you know, as long as you're not outputting a signal, you can read off of those two just fine, or just a regular multimeter. If I use a multimeter, what's it going to read? Um, you just set it up milliamps. It'll read milliamps. Because you're plugging into the loop that's already powered, it's not like when you're trying to move it and generate, and you're, when you're trying to generate a signal and you have to have that power on it, it's already a powered loop and all you're doing is reading what's on that loop. So as long as you go to the, you have your uh, uh, leads plugged into the right spot on the, the multimeter and the multimeter set right, you just read milliamps and it'll, it'll show whatever the system, whatever the circuit has on it. Very good, thank you. Um, the digital stuff, there's actually, I can't remember off the top of my head which it is, but if it's a D400, you can actually just push one of the four control buttons and it'll tell you what, it'll just display what signal it's being given. Hey, Scott. Yes. Ted Hansen has asked in the, in the chat if we can uh, show the knife gate mounting. I don't know how practical that is. I can, I can do that. Um, you want to see the knife gate itself? I believe that's what he's asking. Yeah, it'd be easiest. Come on, muscles. Man. All right, let's see if we can move things around here and get it. I'm going to mess you up, Carly. So you're going to have to move the camera and all. So I'm going to try to get it to where it's a little clearer. All right, so. So this particular unit um, is an Orbinox knife gate. Um, this unit, we do not have a mounting kit per se for knife gates. Um, we can get you most of the way there. We have a bunch of the components. Just like on anything linear, the biggest trick is the pickup point. Um, like I said, this is the knife gate arm that they used. Um, the kit comes with the arm itself. It's listed on one of those documents. Uh, this is 350013, I think is the part number for this kit, for this, for this arm. Um, it takes a D2 spindle and it comes with your linear arm, which what you would do is determine how long this, this is adjustable. So if you don't need it this long, what you would do is slide this arm back tighten it down, cut off the excess so you don't have a big arm waving out there. Uh, it comes with a, what is our pin, and a washer and a bolt. So if it's a large knife gate, you can drill in half, or there's usually holes in the knife gate that you can use to drive this. But always remember, where this gets mounted, this is your second C of your CC. So one C is the center line of the positioner, one C is the center line of where you mount this point. Oftentimes you can replace one of the bolts in the yoke, um, in the clevis in the yoke, so that you can use that as your pickup point. So a lot of people do that. I'll show you the way this one's done. Notice, just taking a look at the way that, that valve is right now, notice that that's a, that's a four inch valve, I believe, right, Scott? Yep. So the positioner is actually offset quite a bit more from center line than it is on the fissure because that four inch stroke means the center to center dimension is much greater which for being that it's above two inches of stroke, we're using 90 degree cam. So looking at the chart and using the formula, that means 0.5, you multiply your stroke of four inches by 0.5, so you have a two inch CC. So it's roughly two inches from the center line of this act, this positioner to the center line of our pickup point where the on the actuator and valve inside. And I'll turn it to where you can see that. This isn't the correct bracket. Um, the second part of what we would offer for a mounting kit on a knife gate is what we call, uh, it's a PMV adapter plate. It's, it would mount, if you got a PMV in place and you wanted to replace it with one of ours, you could use it. But it's very similar to this, that it's just a Z bracket that has some holes and holes for mounting the positioner. Basically all that becomes is a way for you to mount the positioner. Yeah. And especially with this type of uh, fabricated kind of ty type of yoke or uprights, superstructure if you will, it's easier to do because you have a flat plate that you can just drill and tap anywhere to drill your hole to mount this bracket where you need it to be. Because like I said, ideally this thing will be mounted 
perpendicular. There's a way you, you could get it a little closer, but what we want to see is it's pretty perpendicular up and down at 50%. We're at 50% now. We're not quite perpendicular, but we could change it a little bit. But you'll mount, you'll drill and tap this to mount this. And then, you know, you'll just make sure that you take into account your CC dimension and you'll take into account kind of any offset that you have. And sometimes, you know, like with a knife gate with a cast yoke, uh, that, that's not as easy to drill and tap. Um, I used to do a lot of Volan valves, Volan knife gates, and we always welded them, welded the bracket. I don't know if you'll be able to see in there, Ted. Get you a little flashlight out, Scott. Yes. Which one do we want? There you go. So you see the arm, the double or the D or the, the square shape. Uh, spindle, the arm goes over it, and the way they had they have done it on this particular mount, they actually inside of here. I do not know if you'll be able to see that or not, but they've come in and they've changed one of the clevis bolts and added a little neoprene type or a plastic or some type of polymer material spacer that's the same size as the three eighths pin that comes in the kit. So that's one thing that's important that if you do use this arm, you want to make sure that you have a 3 8 OD pin that goes in it so that you don't have any hysteresis, no loss of motion, so that it fits pretty snug in there. Because if you did, if you lose, if you use something real small, it's just going to click up and down. Kent, if we talked about it the other day where uh, had the D400 that had the spindle missing. Uh, the spindle's missing the C-clip or the little clip. It'd be this, it's the same pro concept that it's not tight, so it would just hunt back and forth constantly. I hope that kind of answers your test, your question, Ted. Um, so mounting calibrating knife gates is, or, or mounting knife gates, we, like I said, we don't have a kit specific to them, but we can, like I said, sell you the kit that has this spacer, we can sell you the arm and get you real close, but as far as exact telling you exactly where to mount it, that's going to be up to, to wherever, whatever valve you have. There, there is no standard amongst knife gates for how to mount to the yoke. True. Everybody does it a little different. You know, there's dozens of different yoke designs. So there's round bars and flats, plates like that one, and cast yokes. So there's always a little bit of fussing at it. We can get you somewhere between 90 and 95 percent of the way there but you're going to have to do a little drilling and tapping or welding or something um yokes that are wider well the, we don't have a longer d2 um this that kit actually has a little spacer in it that actually so this is about an inch further out than just snapping the spindle into the back of the positioner we don't really offer that so generally what we've what I've seen and what I've done in the past is just use a longer bolt. Um, kind of like we, it's the same concept as what we do in the mounting kit, uh, the back linear kit, is we'll send you all these bolts and then you use the amount of spacers you need to stack in to get that space out to where, you know, you drive, you're driving it properly. Yeah, that, that spacer that Scott pointed out for the spindle comes with that Z bracket and it's yeah. approximately long. Yeah, this spindle inside of here, the spindle that's that's that extension, the Z bracket or one kit and the bolt of the mounting hardware is one kit. And then this is separate because we offer it in two different lengths. And we have a couple of different designs. This one's a D2, we have a D4 as well. But generally we, we kind of stick with trying to use the D2 as much as possible. So we kind of have a little bit of a standard that if we're doing knife gates, we have the D2 with spindle with the D2 arm. Um, but oftentimes we kind of have to get into making something work and, or somebody wants something else. Well, I've got, you guys have asked a couple of questions. Carly's fixing to ask you guys a couple of questions and see um, who's listening. <laughs> okay, first question. What does CC stand for in CC dimension? And you can leave it in the chat or you can unmute yourself and just chat with us if you'd like to do that. 
<laughs> exactly, Ted. We only need your number, social security number, mother's maiden name. It's a quiet group. Yeah, it is a quiet group. Wow, nobody knows what CC dimension is besides Ted calling a credit card. <laughs> I'll give I'll give them points for for being creative. Center to center, Ted got it. Yep, center line of the position or to the center line of your pickup point. Um, this, like I said, when we design kits, we try our best to make them usable where, where they're not specific to a given size of valve so like i said that knife gate will handle that knife gate kind of what we use for knife gate kit handles a bunch of different sizes of valve so we try not to make it to where we have a kit that's for let's say a one inch worn valve a two inch worn valve a one and a half inch worn valve we try to make the kits flexible so that's why when we get these we try to get these adjustable cc dimensions so we, we could make a kit that was really easy to just make one and has one single hole that you can put your takeoff pin in, your carrier pin in, and now it's a fixed dimension. But with this, it's a little more flexible and you can be able to use it and have a, you know, you're not fixed to one particular valve. Okay, thank you, Ted. Question two, what should be determined before cam selection? Mondo got it. Stroke. Correct. You do need to know the stroke. Kit, did you say stroke as well? Yeah, but I was unmuted. Oh, it was pretty close. It was a pretty close tie. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. And the last one. Is it necessary to order a specific positioner for a linear application? Armando says no, that is correct. Now, the answer is no. Now, you, there are specific things you want, you need to know, like to, to make sure you select the correct cam and you select the right, correct spindle for a given application. But we at VAC, like I've said earlier, we do not have linear specific and rotary specific actuators. All of our actuators are rotary and we use them Position. by the way that we mount. What? You are calling it an actuator. It's a position. Oh, sorry. This is my bad. But Wayne, so, Fleming is, Wayne Fleming is going to. Oh, uh, he's going to kill me. <laughs> but whether it's on a linear or rotary actuator, our positioners, we, we don't differentiate one or the other. You, some might say and argue that we do because you need a C three cam and a D4 spindle, but that's that's going to be important whether you're on linear or rotary, that you have to, uh, that you have to make sure that you get the positioner configured properly for the actuator that isn't going on. Yeah, the positioner isn't different. The mounting hardware and, and adaptation hardware is what's different. So if you're stocking V200s, and mostly put them on rotary valves. The same V200 with you know the change of a spindle and the addition of a mounting kit can work on linear valves. When you get the uh, when you order a kit, do you get a new sticker? Uh, can't you won't get a new sticker uh, with the kit? You would order that as a separate part, or uh, you would order it with the positioner. So if you ordered a uh, you know, with a 30 degree scale, we would install it at, at our shop. Uh, if you, you know, are trying to use a position you have on the shelf, you would have to install that in the field and order it as a separate part. There is one exception on Mason Elon Camflex kits. You um, get a V100 and V200 60 degree scale. Um, so that, that'd be the one exception, because generally people, and you get a cam as well. So, so the cam, the, uh, a C3 cam, 
and a 30 degree mile or 60 degree mile R cover for both B100 and B200 are included in that kit because you know as you know it is one of the very few rotary valves that only turns 55 degrees so it's less than the 90 degrees that most people so if you're a vast majority of what you do is rotary and it's on an actuator like an aircon or a bray or a keystone it's 90 degrees and now you need to mount a cam flex we make sure that those items are in that specific kit yeah but on lin for linear applications we don't usually yeah know. no on the linear applications no so when you order the so a lot of people keep the spare spare indicators or the, the mylar covers or the little stickers, they keep different ones. So in case they use the 60 degree or 30 degree side of that C3 cam, they have each. Hey, Amen. Ah. Um, yeah, okay, okay, Wayne. Um, yeah. If you if you look through our mounting kit list and you don't see anything that's in if you see you've got a valve and you don't see that it's in there um, that your your valve and actuator package you don't see it listed contact us um, constantly uh, I don't think I've done any this week but here lately it seems like one or two a week that we're adding new things to the list now best it's best if possible that we get the valve and actuator package in here. To design the new kit so that I can ensure that it works and I'm happy with it and it's a little quicker with me working with my bracket manufacturer than you going out measuring about um, and sending me dimensions and then I have to talk to my bracket guy that he sends me stuff I send it to you maybe it's right maybe it's not we have to make changes um, but we've done that uh, but uh, oftentimes um, we'll, we'll ask you to go out um, if you need a mounting kit for something and we don't have it if you can go out, we may get at the start where you go out and it's in the field. Um, we'll get some dimensions to you. We've got some drawings we can send you, questions we want an answer, some stuff we need to know. And there's a good chance we have enough components here that we can get you real close. And then um, we can try it from there. But we're constantly um, adding to that kit list. Uh, yeah, so so there's, we've developed a, a library of parts, so to speak, then a lot of times we can, you know, put together a different uh, bill of materials and come up with a kit that, that will work just fine. Uh, usually it's related to differences in the stem takeoff. Um, you know, the mounting is, is, you know, there's only a few ways to actually bolt a bracket on, but the stem takeoff, it seems that everybody's always coming up with some new thing. I mean, we've done a slew of specials. I mean, so please don't don't feel bad about calling us and asking us. I mean, uh, no, Bob, I, I can't, how many, I mean, I can't count how many I've done. I mean, just in oh. a Kello plan alone, I think there is four or five. And then I've done d definitely some CCI valves, some really strange ones that get into crazy stroke links and all sorts of craziness. So but please, please, please don't let that opportunity pass you by. Please uh, call us and let us know. Yeah, especially when you can, you know, like Randy mentioned, CCI uh, or Copes, those guys, you know, those valves are very, very expensive. Uh, if they can move to a, a new positioner and we can, you know, adapt our positioner to, to their valve and save that plant the cost of replacing one of those fantastically expensive valves, um, it's, it's not that hard for us to do. Get us involved. Get Randy or I involved. Pictures always help. Anybody else have any questions? Yeah, I think if we don't have any more questions, we may uh, wrap this up. We set, a, we set a record today for number of questions and interactions. So guys, really appreciate that. Yeah, we really appreciate the interaction. And we know you're there. Thanks, guys. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Scott. Thanks, Kent. Thanks, Bob. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Thank you, Ted. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, <laughs> Good night, John Boy. <laughs> Thank you to everybody. All right, guys. Adios. Talk to you all later. Stay safe.